I met up with Eric Olson yesterday. He is the subject of a documentary stroke drama series on Netflix called Wormwood, which is about the way in which the CIA killed his father. I met up with Eric. I first met Eric last Friday in the cafe around the corner from where I live, and he told me that the CIA had killed his dad, and then we met up again yesterday for the interview that you're about to hear. I start off by putting the microphone down on the table in a reception room in the hotel where he is staying, and I tell him that I will be making this recording for my soon-to-exist, somewhat psychedelic podcast. I then told him about my day, during which I met up with David Weber, the author of The Working Class Shareholder, also American, who teaches at Boston University and had just done a kind of book launch event talking about Labour's capital, that is the capital that is uh, that belongs to trade unions and trade union members in their pensions. There's a guy who is in town today. So the place where I get my books, there's a second-hand bookshop. Well, they do proof copies too in Leicester Square. And um, I saw a copy, a proof copy of a book called The Rise of the Working Class Shareholder. And this book was written by a man called David Weber, double B, um, University of Boston, lawyer, or at least mm -hmm. he has practiced law. And he, he teaches shareholder activism uh, at Boston University. And then he told me, so we met up. Uh, he did a talk this evening, but we met up on week. That's why I didn't get back to oh, you. Oh, I see, you were in talk. Okay. Whilst I was with him. Um, but he said that uh, pretty soon Harvard will have asked him, because of his book, they've asked him to run uh, like a module at their, um, at their course for trade unions. And I said, Come again? <laughs> yeah, and he really. said, well, the thing is that, you know, Harvard, you know, they've got so much money and everything like that, that, you know, they aim to be number one at everything. So when they decided, you know, they must have at some point, I don't know when, they decided to do a course for trade unions. So people who want to be trade union leaders um, would be doing really? that course. So it's kind of like gold. In the business school or where would it be? He didn't say. The Kennedy School? I doubt that. Yeah. Because uh, you're at Harvard, right? Yeah. Okay. And you're doing I mean, they've had a lot of trouble with lawyer, with uh, unions, actually. Uh, I, although I think they, they, in the past year or two, they made some settlement with the union uh, that handled you know, the food handlers. Right, what, because they weren't paying them more? Yeah, it was a, it was a strike. I'm not, I'm not, and what I heard was it was resolved on fairly, you know, acceptable terms for the, for the laborers. I don't know, but that's what I, I didn't follow it closely. Now, why don't you tell me, so you said something ontological, and I, and I said, so what is the thing that you sort of do without meaning to excessively categorize you? And you made it sound as though it was ontological, storytelling, something visual. Um, is it a series yeah. of principles to do with communication? Because it sounded almost to do with the way in which you live your life. You know, not you, but in general. But. And, and, yeah, and you're on to it, yeah. Maybe the best way to tell it, 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 telling it briefly is a problem, however you approach it. But, yeah, and, but, but one way to get into it is, since we mentioned Harvard, uh, that's where I began this thing. Uh, in the beginning, well, let me start with this. I was working with a guy named Robert J. Lifton, who is a fairly well-known psychiatrist, you know, older now and retired, but active in what was called then psychohistory. And he had, you know, become well known for his book on Hiroshima, survivors of Hiroshima. When I was in graduate school, I worked with him on a bunch of different projects. And one of them was a study of innovative young adults. And we needed a method for this. And the idea was, something that would show how people configure and reconfigure the elements of their lives. And through a number of different pathways, I came to the idea that something around the notion of collage would be a vehicle, could be a vehicle for asking people to 
do something that would reflect how they actually organize pieces of their own lives. So I started this in a pretty informal way as kind of an interview technique that would you know, further interview sequence that was already in motion with these people uh, who were in the beginning lawyers, uh, innovative young lawyers, scientists. We were going to do a bunch of different groups. And when is this? Seventies. This is in the seventies. Yeah, actually, one of the things that got me started on this was uh, Picasso, whose birthday is tomorrow. I think his birthday is tomorrow. I can check that. I'm pretty sure it's tomorrow. Um, died um, in seventy-three, April seventy-three, and uh, and. Reading about him and you know his breakthrough from Cubism to collage and so on with Brock in, in around 1911 and 12, it really got me thinking. You know, there's more to this collage idea than people have appreciated, particularly psychologists who haven't you know, appreciated it at all. I mean, so I started this work with this a crude notion of collage, and. Uh, Eventually wrote my doctoral thesis on this method. Um, this method of how to well, get use, people to tell you about the way in which they arrange their lives. As this, this became a kind of a, what I thought of as a kind of microcosm. In other words, I would ask people, and along the way too, the, the, the methodology is tricky with collage because you've got to have stuff. And the question is, okay, what's the stuff you're going to use for this process? And my idea was it needs to be photographs. One of, one of the other kind of directions into this had been the work of a, a psychologist who is well known for his work with children and, and also for sort of psychobiography named Eric Erickson, and uh, who I got to know during those years. And he had talked about how play constructions with children kind of release a lot of kind of not only energy but kind of deep uh, principles of how they kind of organize the world and they, they get very excited about what they make and they, they're eager to tell you about what it is once they kind of configure these toys in this table. So I thought you know that's what we need is something like that. So I decided the elements wouldn't be toys they would be photographs and uh, which immediately landed me in a problem because how do you get hundreds and hundreds of really interesting photographs to use as the grist for collage making, which in is what, what in, in what sense is that a challenge? What intellectual property? Getting the copyright? No, or, just getting just, just getting people. large copies of good photographs right. in large numbers, especially in the seventies when you know color copiers very are certainly expensive. not what they are today. Very expensive. And and very expensive. Quality. It would have been very expensive. But at, at that point, there was a, a kind of a breakthrough and. Uh, through a chain of connections, Harvard connections actually, I got to know somebody at Timeline Books who was public relations director there, and he agreed to send me up two tons of Timeline photographic books, which was, it, it opened up a window uh, for me. As in like Life magazine? Well, not magazine. Life magazine. They had, these were books. I mean, they published a lot of different... Time Life, did you Time say? Life, yeah. Life. A series and one series they publish is on photography and there's like I don't know at that time there were like 20 books you know in that series very well illustrated and so they sent me 50 copies of every book in that series plus a lot of other series right. suddenly I had this huge people called it Stonehenge piles of books in my flat uh, which I proceeded to kind of cut up and you know use as one source of supply for this configurational exercise. The word collage doesn't really hold up too well when you get deeper, more deeply into what I was doing. It was a configurational exercise. And because the photographs were large, it couldn't be made on a table. It had to be made on the floor. And when you say configurational, that's because the subject is the one who does the configuration. Exactly, exactly. And they, do, and they had to do it on the floor because the table wasn't big enough. And... But that turned out to be a, a, a real breakthrough. When you get people crawling around on the floor organizing stuff, the body gets into it, you know, in what they now would call embodiment, you know, which was a kind of, has become a, a big kind of a buzzword. Back in the 70s, nobody heard about an embodiment. But it seemed to me that the body's ways of organizing itself in space 
were crucial to what we were after. You know, I mean, that was just my kind of intuitive sense of it all. It was really a phenomenological method. How do you get into the experiential world of somebody and let them tell you, but first of all, construct and then tell you based on their construction how they organize their movement in the world, you know? And photographs become a kind of proxy for that. And photographs are a very special kind of medium. They're not paintings, they're not drawings, they're something else, you know? So anyway, so this, this became the, the sort of stage one of this. And I was in the middle of doing this work when suddenly this whole other side of my life exploded, namely... Which I saw at the beginning of the thing, Seymour Hirsch. And you perhaps being from the most uncurious family in the world, <laughs> despite at five years old saying, hey, why am I being told to let go of this? And like, exactly. you, know, you couldn't tell Seymour at the time, of course. Hey, I was onto something, but Mama told me to shut up. <laughs> exactly. You, 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 you come a long way in, this, in, in uh, one episode. Wait till you get further in. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So this thing in 75 exploded out of nowhere, you know, echoing this, you know, horrendous experience 22 years earlier, which had happened in 53. So now we're in 75, and I had kind of learned to manage that in some kind of way through repression and various other things. But also, you know, this guy who I mentioned who I was working with, Lifton, um, one of the ways I got involved with him was he had been doing a study of scientists, Oppenheimer and Teller in particular, the two you mm. know, key the people of the bomb. And he gave a lecture, which, you know, this was the first contact I had with him. He gave a lecture called Prophetic Survivors, and it was about the way Oppenheimer and Teller, who both worked on the atomic bomb, then went totally different directions. Oppenheimer you know, posed further thermonuclear weapons. Oppenheimer loved the bomb, one of the eight Teller. bomb. I yeah. mean, Teller. Was Teller German or American? German. Okay. Yeah. They so both they had both German were, roots, yeah. but Tellers were more immediate. Um, Oppenheimer's family had been here for... Oh, was, was, was Teller also Jewish? Because Oppenheimer... I th- I, yeah, Oppenheimer was Jewish. I think Teller... I can't, I can't tell. say. I think he might have been actually, but I'm not. I'm not. So, I'm not sure of that. Because von Neumann, well, yeah. uh, I remember when I heard about von Neumann and read about him. I remember some of the quotes. I mean, very entertaining. Are you a communist? I'm violently anti-communist. Apparently, that's what he said. So, right. Uh, right. So you know, he would have gone in the teller direction. But yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, um, Lifton. Lifton would gave this lecture on those two. Dire- you know, reactions of the scientists who made. Uh, you know, weapons to the success they had in, in creating this huge weapon of mass destruction. And it, when I heard that, th- this was, you know, a, c- a couple of years, this was in 71. And I was just blown away by it because it was the first time I'd ever heard anybody address the whole notion of the psychology of weapon scientists. And I started to think, you know, this could, this somehow pertains to my father in some kind of way. Mm. And I just, and that, that was what drew me to Lipton's work to start with. Um, so and you knew that your father was involved in biological stuff. Yeah. You did know that. Yeah. Um, we knew that this, yes, we knew that. And that this, in the town where we lived, there was this place, Fort De- Camp Dietrich, it was then called Fort Dietrich subsequently, which was a, was a bacteri- bacteriological weapons research place, although they always said purely defensive use of these weapons. None Which state was it? Maryland. It's about an hour northwest of Washington. Yeah. So, so I keep forgetting that Maryland is a state in itself, right? It's okay. a state, yeah. Right. Yeah, so we knew, so I, yeah, we, that, we, we, that was not a secret that, that, that they were doing biological weapons. And so Lifton's lecture made you think, Ah, okay. In a way, that that's something. Well, what I started to think immediately, which turns out to be kind of true. I mean, I didn't know much then, but when I heard this lecture, what my reaction? First of all, I was kind of blown away by it, just because it sort of spoke to a part of me that I'd never really formulated clearly, and no, and I had never heard anyone speak about, you know, the psychology of weapons scientists in a way that, mm. that might connect. I mean, it was a whole area that was like sealed off in some way. But when I, my immediate reaction was, well, 
you, you could have an Oppenheimer who reacts against the bomb and has the philosophical resources to make a critique of what he's been doing, which is what he did. I mean, he was a very intellectual, sure, sure, deep, sure. deeply philosophical. He quoted, he quoted the Bhagavad Gita, didn't he? Exactly. Yeah. I've become death and destroy over worlds. That's what, you know. And, and then Teller, who was a more kind of just reflexive, you know, um, anti-communist, but ju ju just to say this before you go to your next thing, I remember coming across a book called The Nuclear Barons where they talk about the beginning of that industry, of the weapons side. And one of the things that they said was that um, people were knocking on the door of the British intelligence establishment and saying, you do know I've actually come from Hungary or, you know, from around there. And you do know that you need to get your arse in gear because they're about to create this. And so exactly. that was one of the right. quite good reasons to do it. Well, that was what that was essentially the letter that Einstein wrote to Roosevelt, saying we've got to set up Los Alamos. Really, right? Became, well, well, the whole Manhattan Project, Los Alamos, became part of it. The, you know, the major part of it, actually, um, because if we don't, we, we you know they may have the bomb. Right. And that and, you know it was Eisenhower, it was Einstein who wrote that letter. Okay, I didn't. And, know. Yeah. So, but anyhow, what I started to think about in response to this lecture was, you know, what if you, what if you had somebody who sort of fell in between uh, poles of this opposition, wasn't quite an Oppenheimer, but wasn't a teller either, and, and fell into some kind of crisis about the whole thing, couldn't really resolve it, you mm. know, uh, then you've got a real mess on your hands. And I thought, well, that could have been, that could have been the situation of my father, um, so anyway, I heard this lecture by Lifton at, at Harvard, actually, at the Divinity School, that was where he gave it, and I decided to go to Yale and study with him, which I did for a year. And then when I came back to Harvard to get my PhD, I continued to work with him, even though he was at Yale. Is Yale um, on the other side of the country? No, it's just south. It's, it's, right. it's, it's just north of New York. It's okay. in Connecticut. New Haven, Connecticut. So it's, you know, it's a couple of, you know, maybe three hours. So you went to Yale to study with him? Yeah, I did, yeah. I really, yeah, that was the whole purpose. And then you started collaborating with him? Yeah. And, and, and the study, which I'm now talking about, that involved this configurational method, grew out of what he did after he studied the survivors of Hiroshima. His, his, his main... Right, that's going all the way around to the other side, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. So, so he, his, the book that he's most well known for, I mean, probably even still, although he's written a lot of others subsequently, but he wrote a book called Death and Life, Survivors of Hiroshima, which was spent, he spent many, many months in Hiroshima interviewing people who had been there when the bomb was dropped. And it's a horrendous book. I mean, it is a terrible experience to read this thing. Um, and after he did that, he then spent some time in Tokyo, and his and he got fascinated with Japanese youth in the sort of this was in the early mid '60s, and the kind of experimental lifestyles which they were developing. And he wrote a we wrote an article about them and their kind of attempt to revive the culture and revive kind of their own you know patterns of life and so on. And he called it Protean Man, after the Greek god Proteus, who was a shapeshifter, that kind of idea. So that was, this, so there's, this, and, he, and he always said, there are these two poles of his work, Holocaust and transformation. And, you know, so here we have the atomic bomb and these Japanese youth. And so the, so I started to, when I started to work with him, I said, look, this 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 idea of the protean and protean improvisational style does that mean regeneration? You kind, of, kind of, yes, but it also means, in terms of psychological theory, what he was really doing was challenging again the notion of Eric, that came from Eric Erickson, who had this life cycle theory in which he placed identity as kind of the pivotal moment following you know child development and just prior to entry into full adulthood. And an identity is this crystallization of a sense of self. And this is your ontological. This is your ontologicalism, isn't it? Well, it's, in a way, where is the beginning, it starts to begin. Right? Yeah, it, it's the beginning. It, it, it's the beginning of it. So, and what Lifton was saying, well, 
you know, it may have been like that at one point in history that, you know, this, you go through these stages and you come to identity and that becomes yeah. the foundation for the rest of your life. But now, you know, modern society is so kind of in flux and so on that, that identity is constantly being recreated. And it's this constant recreation process rather than a crystallization, which he called, oh, Jesus, this son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll ignore him for now, yeah. <laughs> John Bolton on the screen, everybody. <laughs> nuclear treaty. Oh dear. Yeah, speaking, oh it's man, there we go. There we go. Oh man. Okay. So. Um. <laughs> speaking of. Yeah. Creation and destruction. Yeah. So the idea was that you know the protean style is a kind of continuous recreation of identity in some way, and I had said, well, that's fascinating, but I don't understand how it really works. And how do you, you know, how do you really observe it and, you know, what goes into it and so on. So this was why we started doing a study of young adulthood. And this configurational slash collage method became the vehicle for this study of young adulthood. Okay, so this was you saying, um, how do we check whether or not this works? Uh, Or what it is, really. I mean, how do we even understand it? Yeah. Well, that's good. That's a good picture. Yeah. Um, so you were testing a model? Well, uh, uh, and it, I would say an incipient model. I mean, that was the problem. His essay was a very kind of literary and free associative, and it wasn't, it wasn't very sharply etched in terms of what exactly he was describing. But it was very, you know, impressionistic and kind of interesting and... Fertile. It seemed very fertile to me, but I kept wondering, well, what the hell is this exactly? Was he talking about beginnings? Was he talking about cycles? Was he alluding to these things? All of those questions were pertinent to what he had written, you know. Um, he, was, he, he, he was quoting Jean-Paul Sartre, and he was quoting, you know, um, um, a Norman Mailer, and all kinds of, you know, modern writers and literary figures and so on, philosophers. Um, and it seemed like there was something really interesting going on, but I, I felt th- this, this could be the basis of a, of a real study. So that's what we were starting to. That's what we were doing, and that's it was in that context we started using a, a standard psychological quote unquote projective test called the thematic apperception test. And when, when we when I used that with these young adults, they all kind of said, "This is so tedious and boring. We hate this," you know. So I said to Lifton, you know, I think we need something that really reflects the spirit of what we're doing. Now, what was the first test? Was it just like a form? Well, it was, a, it was made with ambiguous drawings where you would see a scene and it could be interpreted in two, at least two, usually it was kind of an ambivalent scene that could be taken in two different ways. And the idea was, if you tell a story as you look at this picture, you know, in which you try to unfold what's actually happening, the story then reveals the tendencies in your own unconscious. Uh, and, it, and it turned out that test had been made by a guy named Henry Murray, who was by that time a pretty old man, who, who had been a kind of a premier psychologist, who was actually in retirement at Harvard, and I was getting to know him at the same time, and, and kind of understanding what he was after in this test. And the more I understood what he was after in a test, the more I thought, this is not for us. This is some other thing. You know, it's based on another assumption, another thing. We need something else. So Lifton said, look, if you don't like the standard test, why don't you make something of your own? I said, great. <laughs> Let me add it. So that's when Picasso died and I started reading. There was a, there was a huge obituary in the New York Times right, about Pablo Picasso, protean artist of the you know, 20th century. Ooh. And I thought, protean, that's it. And of course he is. I mean, he's the, he's the archetype of protean recreation. I mean, in his own style. He's always on to something different. He's always recreating the, his, 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 you know, his work and coming from another point of view. And, but the heart of his work, as many people you know, have I many art historians have pointed out, is this Cubist moment. I mean, the, you know, the, the early Cubism and collage were a fundamental moment, not only for him, but for 20th century art in general. And uh, so, you know, I was deep into this work with this so-called collage method 
when, as I was just saying earlier, boom, suddenly the, the Washington Post publishes a story about my father, and it, although his name was not given, this is a very important point. Yeah, they said that. They said it could only have been him, but they didn't give his well, name. Well, we figured they out. They just said it's a scientist. Who, who jumped out the window after having been drugged with LSD, but they didn't say who. You know, very strange kind of and a then, thing. And then you, I saw you in the Errol Morris thing saying, how many are there? Exactly. And the, the title of the article that we saw, that was the, the, the Washington Post description of what had just been published that day, namely the so-called Rockefeller Commission, who was invest, which was investigating the CIA following Seymour Hersh's revelations, the, the title of the article in the Washington Post was Suicide Reveal. And later on, I came to the conclusion, this title is doubly, this headline, doubly ironic. First of all, it isn't a suicide. Second of all, it wasn't revealed. They didn't even say who the person, the name was, even though they had the name, which is very telling. I mean, it's very weird that they, and they, nor did they notify the family that some news is going to come out. It's like you find a POW or a MIA, an MIA who's been, you know, lost for decades, you know, he's up in the woods somewhere, and you find him, but you don't notify the family. That's what this was, you know. Mm. So we f figure out that this was indeed my father, and, you know, have a press conference in the backyard. Bam! Within a week, the New York, the, 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 the uh, White House is inviting us to come to meet the president. Yeah, and then I saw you said, they <laughs> tried to say, let's put this through Congress which is a very interesting attitude towards, uh, what is it, culpability, I suppose. That's taking the blame off the table kind of thing. Well, what it's really taking off the table, and this I found out you know, years later when I got hold of the correspondence between Donald Rumsfeld and, and uh, uh, Dick Cheney, who at that time were the senior aides to Gerald Ford. This is 30 years before they... Yes, yeah, before, they, before that they become, you know, before yeah. they take over the world. Yeah. <laughs> they were just, they, they were important, but they were not people you knew about, you know. Yeah. They were, they were seen, they were like Jared Kushner or something, you know. I mean, uh, they were young guys. Um, and, but it turned out that as soon as we got on to the fact of who this was, that this person had a name... His name was Frank Olson, and we're gonna, we, we want the full story of this. Bam! It set off all kinds of alarm bells. And they decided that we got to keep this family out of court. Because if we went to court, we would be entitled to certain documents, particularly documents describing what my father was doing, which they wouldn't give us. Right. And if they didn't give them to us, we, they would then have no defense. Because we'd be entitled to these documents. So, do, you so remember, the, do you remember how I mentioned Gregory Bateson to you before? Yes. This is a double bind. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I knew you were going to say it. Yeah, exactly. 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 You so, had Rumsfeld in the double bind then. You were there just going, like, Yeah, hey, but, 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 but we weren't up to this level. We didn't know what the, we were dealing with, actually. That's the problem. Yeah. We had suddenly gotten into some very deep shit. And we're just like... We have no, we're not used to operating at this level, meeting the president, get, you know, all this stuff. So they, they tell us, look, we only care about you. We want you to get an adequate settlement for your pain, your suffering, and all everything else. So, and we're afraid that if you go to court, you're going to lose. We don't want you to lose. Therefore, we recommend you, you go to Congress. We're going to help you get what's called a private bill, which is a compensation for an individual or family, not a, a social group. And you, you're, everyone's going to live happily so ever after. it's not a class action kind of thing. Exactly. It's not a class. And it's not a, it's not a you know, a, a political entity. It's not a state. It's not a, you know, a population. It's an individual or yeah. a family. So we're going to help you get this bill in Congress that will compensate you without the risk that you would have going to court. And it was all presented as if we want, we're in this for you. Yeah. But we had no idea what we were dealing with. We had no idea what, I mean, first of all, if you get invited suddenly to the White House to get up an apology for the pres from the president, which has never happened in the history of the country from George Washington to Donald Trump, nobody has ever gotten an apology in the Oval Office from the president. Nobody. Not the American Indians who were subject to genocide, not the American 
Afro-Americans who were subject to, you know, hundreds of years of slavery. Only us. Not the Japanese who were in internment camps. They got, they got a Rose Garden apology, I don't know how many years later. But only we have a press conference in a backyard. Bam! Please come to the White House. The Oval Office, which is a very sacred space. You don't get in there for an apology from the president lightly. But we didn't realize what was happening here, that this was so unique, you know. And, and it, what it meant was that we had hit a, some kind of a central nerve in the whole, you know, you know uh, construction of the state. You know, I mean, this was a fundamental thing. We, but we didn't know. We didn't know what we were into. And they were apologizing. Oh, my God. We, you know, the question was, they were very unclear what they were apologizing for. But the overall sense of it was... You know, your father had been drugged and in less, and there wasn't proper medical supervision. This was part of an experiment. Oh my God, they shouldn't have done this. If they did do it, they should take better care of him, and and they shouldn't have put him in a hotel on the on the thirteenth floor. And if they did put him on the thirteenth floor, they should, <laughs> should keep a watch of him. I mean, it was like what. What are you and, and then if all this happened, you're even better off just shutting up. <laughs> exactly, it's, it's 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 very reminiscent of this Jamal uh, uh, Khashoggi business now, where the Saudis cannot come up with a consistent explanation of what the heck happened. You know, so they they, they end up saying, well, it was some kind of an accident where you know he fist fight, he, fist fight and you know we t- resisted and, and accidentally strangled the guy. <laughs> Yeah, and, and there's nobody. <laughs> and there's nobody. And we had 15 people to help in case such a thing happened. Uh, and, and then they sent someone out who dressed in, you know, body double. A crazy story. I and mean, this is almost like JFK stuff, isn't it? I mean, the, the degree to which the, the layers... But, but again, you know, in 1975, we had no idea of these layers. I mean, we didn't know what the hell... I, but I must say, I felt... From the moment we, 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 you know, the White House invited us, and actually even when the first story came out, which, which didn't have his name, but it had this account that the scientists had been drugged and, you know, and then he jumped out the window. Well, the problem was that the drugging, if there was any drugging, which I'm very skeptical, but if there was, the drugging would have happened something like nine days earlier, you know? So, but what about closure? So, so, so what happens? So you go in there. Closure? Um, are you kidding me? No, 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 but they're aiming for closure. Well, they're aiming, they're aiming to get, they're aiming to get rid of us. Yeah, they're so aiming to get rid of the problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so, that was so you mean by closure, okay. So, so, yeah, so in terms of closure, obviously, I mean, in two sides. Okay. So one, on the legal side, and in the other side, you know, financial, the legal, and, you know, the, the how do we stop talking about this? Right. But there's them, and then there's for you, at what point do you realize, oh, if I was being fobbed off when I was five... No, no. No, I was, if I was being fobbed off when I was nine, then, what was it, 22 and now, years? Now, now, that, now that I'm, 30, now that I'm 31, yeah. I'm being fobbed off again. Exactly. How long did it take you before you fully you know, said, oh my God, I'm being fobbed off again. Is this never going to end? Because I take it, it's never ended. Well, no, it, it actually did end, and that, well, we can come to that if you want. I mean, that's the Seymour Hersh thing. It, it, did, it, it did end. Uh, in, 19, in 2014. For, oh, for me. Oh, for me, God. it ended. How long was that? So that's 40 years. That's 60 years from when it happened. Sorry, 40 years from 70, whatever. 40. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, because I think I saw Seymour Hersh because he comes to London quite a lot. Right, yes, yes. So I saw him in 2013, around the same time as the Snowden revelations came Right, out, right, right. You know, by, by, by accident, I mean, I, in this, this place I've been staying, the Frontline Hotel, they just told me, that I was sleeping in uh, um, uh, uh, Julian Assange's the same bed that he had stayed in. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're friends with him. They're friends with him, yeah. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> so, so 2014 something happened. What happened in, tw- yeah, there's a lot of increments in this story. I mean, if you go sort of page by page over these years, from, you know, 1975, then another big turning point is, you know, uh, 1994 when, uh, you know, we exhumed the body. That was obviously a very important point. You'll come to that in the film. You haven't mm. gotten that far. But there are a lot of incremental points along the way in which uh, 
the weight of evidence begins to tilt decisively toward intentional murder, you know, toward murder. But this is 40 years after your father passes away, you exhume the body. Well, yeah, more than 40. I mean, from 1953 to 1994. Four. Yeah, yeah okay. actually that was 40, yeah, okay. Uh, so, yes, that, it took a long time to come to that point of, dis, uh, you know, and what, one of the things that had happened, in, 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 in 1975, we go, to the pre, we go to the White House, get this apology from the president, at which time he tells us, by the way, the director of the CIA, whose name is William Colby, wants to host you in his office at the CIA in a few days. Would you be available to go? And he wants to give you documentation which will explain everything. So we then go to have a lunch in the executive dining room of the seventh floor, the, direct, the dec, director's dining room in Langley, Virginia, the CIA headquarters. Is that the Pentagon? No, this, the, this, the Pentagon is... D D D D D DC, right, yeah. DC, uh, or yeah, actually Virginia too. But anyway, this is, uh, Langley, the CIA headquarters is in another place. Okay. Uh, so again, how many people have a lunch with the director of the CIA in the executive dining room? Not many. That would yeah. be very few. <laughs> Probably <Sure>. zero. <laughs> so we have lunch with him, and at the end of this th thing, he, he uh, gives us this pile of documents, which... It purports to explain what happened, you know. I take these documents, go back to Cambridge, start pouring through these things, and immediately feel like I don't understand anything here. These documents were a complete mess. Inconsistent narratives written by different people, different points of view, different stories, different, I mean, with all kinds of, you know, heterogeneous elements floating around and no kind of coherent narrative at all. And I thought, what is this? You know, this was, I mean, and, but this process of kind of trying to deal with this, these documents over many years and finally coming to the conclusion that these things have nothing whatever to do with what happened. They are a set of cover documents. And in fact, this is what they were. The CIA often keeps different level layers of documents. One, the top layer is for an internal cover-up, but then there are other layers, right, that are, that are more true to what, you know, what the events actually were. We got the top layer, which was the cover story back in 53, which now becomes the quote-unquote deep truth in 1975. But the deep truth in 75 turns out not to make any sense either, turns out to be a cover-up, and um, so I was very upset with, by these things, because I, you know, this is like, it, they would have been better to leave this alone, you know, but they now... 20 years to bullshit you. Yeah, exactly. And... Um, <laughs> it's horrendous. It's horrendous. It's actually horrendous. The whole thing is horrendous. You know, but it speaks to the fact that when the things, the thing, the the, the, the documents, not the documents, but the but the kind of uh, 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 journalistic summary of the documents, which was the Washington Post story that came from the from the Rockefeller Commission report on the CIA, the reason they didn't notify us was they didn't want us to get onto this story because if anybody got onto this story and really started looking into it, there was a chance they were going to figure out this doesn't make any more sense than the previous story made. The good thing about the co the previous story was you knew he didn't understand. Yeah. Now you're being told, well, here's the story. Yeah. Feel better now? I didn't feel better at all. I felt like, what the fuck? What is this, you know? Um, but I, you know, I had other stuff to do. I was in the midst. Of, so what I did, actually, I got these documents. I went back to Cambridge spent some time with this stuff, but basically I decided I'm going to disconnect the phone and write my, start, start writing my doctoral thesis. And I had so much energy now built up and so much determination to not think about this business. So, you know, within a few months, I hadn't planned to you know, write my whole dissertation like this, but within a few months, the whole thing was done. 
it just poured out. I mean, suddenly I had 500 pages. My thesis advisor was like really blown away. He says, where did this come from? And, you know, by the following spring, I had the doctorate. That was it, you know. It was like, uh, but, but once I had the doctorate, my mind started to go back to this other stuff, and I felt extremely unresolved about this. And I continued to do the, 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 uh, the work with the, this method I had um, been on to. And in fact, over the next few years, from say the mid-70s to the mid-80s, that 10 years, I took the method much, much further than it had been. Um, and the method is becoming about how we assimilate information and how we are who we think we are. No. If I, if I had to say now what I think it is, I think it's about what I, and I invented a term for this, what, what I think it now is, uh, the term that I use for it is ontological recapitulation. What I think the method is about, it's an interface. An interface to what? It's an interface to the, to the central organizing algorithm, which is transformative for the human being, which is every human being enters this world as an infant and goes through a series of stages which culminate in adulthood. And by, adult, and, and, and by going through these stages, you first of all kind of inhabit the body, become familiar with how to move around and you know, orient yourself spatially and perceptually and motorically, after which you start to learn language and you kind of acquire symbolization and, and, and semiosis. And, and, and later you, you acquire the ability for, you know, discursive thought, conceptualization, anticipating the future, decision-making, all the things that we associate with the prefrontal cortex. Okay. My question was, implicitly, but later I kind of was able to formulate this, if that's the kind of tr central transformational algorithm that produces the, the adult human being, how do you access that again? Can you step twice into the same river? Can you access that huge... Undergo the same process, journey? Well, the form of it, not literally. You, 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 couldn't do it, you, you couldn't do it literally. It's not literally the same. So what do you mean? Well, what I mean is, can you symbolically recreate that logic in some way? So that you are, in a certain sense, born again. You're, do you mean like a computer program? Kind of like an algorithm. Well, I, I would use the term algorithm. It's not exactly okay. like a computer program, but it's, but it's a program that has a logic in it. And could you reaccess that logic so that you... And, and, and make one way of understanding this is to contrast it with the usual psychological idea, which is based on regression. You start with somebody's kind of, you know, discursive explanation of their experience of the world and you kind of decompose it back to the images or motivating feelings which lie behind that. My idea was, well that's great, but it's not a developmental process. The developmental process goes the other way. It goes from feeling and image formation and perception and bodily experience to the formation of finally of the capacity for articulate speech and reasoning and so on. You don't decompose, you, you produce this form. That's where the energy is. If you want to go in, if you want to seize upon the transformative energy that's at the heart of the human mind, brain, body nexus, then you have, then it has to be a progressive process, not a regressive one. But the problem is, how do you do it? How do you do it? Because you can't start with speech. Speech is, speech comes sort of later on. Right. And, and discursive thought, reasoning, you know, formal explanations, so what you mean, how do you get an adult to be a beginner? Exactly. How do, you, how do you get an adult to be a beginner? To start from the beginning. And it turns out, and I think one of the reasons that collage has been so important and, and you know, was so important and continues to be so in 20th century art history, was that a lot of artists and literary the and art, art theorists and critics perceived, and, I, and a lot of my work quotes from a lot of these people, they perceived there was something in this that has to do with the symbolic process, the way in which symbolization moves and develops. And, but no, as far as I know, nobody has tried to, and, and I didn't try either from the beginning to make this into a formal method. I kind of stumbled onto it and then realized 
Jesus, something's happening here. Because the people who went through this process as I evolved it more and more would say things like, this has some kind of propulsive intensity. It's like, it moves. Oh. Are you talking about the evolution of image generation or image processing or something to do with the I'm talking about the, the, the I'm talking about the cognitive process in general. It's not just imagery. It's the, it, it, it's the whole logic of what becomes, you know, uh, a, adult cognitive cap- capability. So you know Damasio? Damasio, yeah. Is this in relation to some of what he talks about when he talks about, and I'm not a psychologist, by the way, I understand, I remember reading something where he talked about the complexity of producing even one moment of consciousness. Uh, can you imagine the complexity? You know, it's all very nice being a behaviourist and making these assumptions about how we're all the same and we react in these certain ways, you know, we just reflect to things. But actually, can you imagine what it would be like to even produce one moment of consciousness, you know, artificially or even in the real sense? You can't even describe a moment, so how do you... Yeah, I'm less interested in how you describe a moment of consciousness than I am in the stages that lead to, you know, full cognitive capability. Mm. What we call consciousness obviously goes through stages. I mean, a child has consciousness, but not the same consciousness that an adult has, and one of the main differences is the historical part of it. The, sure. the, the sense of a future, the sense of a past, uh, you know, um, the sense of being able to anticipate. Um, so are you sort of asking how did we get here? How, how did we get here and how can we use the understanding of how... In other words, how can you use developmental psychology as a formative model into which you plug your own experience so that you can sort of jumpstart the machine again? That's what it's really about. How do you jumpstart the machine again? And who needs to jumpstart the machine? Everybody. It's, this is what, what, you know, one of the now, things. May I, may I be very confrontational? Absolutely. Are you sure it's not just you who needs to jumpstart the machine? Certainly I needed to jumpstart the machine. If I hadn't, I would never have stumbled upon this. But I think it's an example of, you know, Erickson talks about certain kinds of people who have identity conflicts so intense that they need to resolve for everyone or large numbers of people what they can't resolve for themselves alone. In other words, you get on to some thematic issue uh, which you, know, you feel particularly intensely because of your own history, your own experience, your own predicament, whatever, and in some cases it resonates with what other people are implicitly struggling with too. I think this has to do ultimately with the sense of fragmentation in the modern world. I think this has to do with image overstimulation, assaults on cognition, you know, uh, the kind of trauma, traumatic environment that we all live in, the kind of... Did you say it leads somebody to try and solve something for other people that they can't solve for themselves? Alone. They can't, right. it's, in other words, your own predicament becomes a so model. you need to connect. Well, you, you, you know, in, in other words, you do, you, you do something that addresses your own situation. And in certain circumstances, this is, this is one way innovation happens. In certain circumstances, if your own situation is kind of exemplary in some way, or paradigmatic in some way, be, you know, then it, yeah, you're the frontier. Yeah, you, you happen to be on a frontier, which you didn't choose. Yeah. <laughs> And you're not happy about it. And nobody else is going to be doing it either anytime soon. <laughs> but, it, but it gives you, a, you know, I've been called, uh, you know, uh, the word obsessed has occurred in, in descriptions of me based on this film. Yes, I've been obsessed, but not by the death of my father. What I've really been obsessed by is this method, which I think is really, you know, profound. Not just because it addresses what I've gone through, but because of what I've seen when I've used it with other people. And it was, it was, it was that. Are you talking about helping them deal with trauma? I'm talking about trauma. So jumpstart the machine. Well, not, it's, yeah. It's, jump, it's more jumpstart the machine. Right? Yes. Well, my idea is, is taking this away from a therapeutic model or a symptom driven model. This is not symptom driven. This is driven by the logic of symbolization, the logic of development. If something is driven in that way, then it's going to be useful for a lot of stuff. It's going to be, it's, it's sort of like accessing the, the central transformer of the human spirit, in a now, way. Now, question, do you use film quite a lot? Do I use film? Yeah, because collage, 
or at least what we called collage before. So let's say Time Life give you thousands of, of pictures and stuff like that. Lots of pictures. Um, in some way, if you watch a, a film, it's lots of pictures too. Um, they may be very, very highly related to each other much more than the collage thing. But do you use film to do your ontological... Recapitulation. Recapitulation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, what happened was, and here we need to kind of go back to where we were earlier. When I started this thing, I saw it mostly as a configurational method. You get down on the floor, you make this thing, and that's the thing. What I later saw was, once you have this configuration, what do you do with it? And my theory was, you don't want to just talk about it. You want to put the thing in motion. You want to use it to take it further. Where does it want to go? So what you... What, 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 you mean what, there is a process that you undergo. You, the, that, that, you, that the thing undergoes. Yeah, the thing in that other, you... In so other words, you're just you, there doing it. In other words, you've built something which is implicitly some kind of system. But don't take its life away from it by just forgetting about it. No. Give it a life. Well, put it, it in, put it in motion. And this, this speaks to your use of the, of the notion of motion pictures or film. What I found out was what, what this thing wanted was not so much to be filmed. It, what, it, what it seemed to be asking for was a process where you took the images and put them into time, mostly by complex um, projections where you had multiple images being it's like a series of pendulums swinging in and out something like the, that something like that. that what I found out was that in every collage that I ever construction actually in the end I, I started calling this a virtual life space map what really becomes interesting is to think of this as a kind of a map an experiential map and in, in, in every case what I found so far what I found was that there's always some part of this thing that involves a variant. Something can be switched. There's a kind of a built-in alteration somewhere in this system. And if you put this thing in, you know, start activating this switch, it transforms the whole system. Speaking of if, I take it the whole world of Bayesian probability plays some kind of a role in what you're talking about. It probably does. I didn't approach it in that way, but it probably does. Yeah. Because the, you know, the, on the one hand, I think they do that if this, then that. But then also, there is a language component in there. I'm sure. Absolutely. There's you a know, huge language component. It's disjunctive uh, and there's certain moves. Well, it turns out that the central mechanism of language, according to none other than a guy named Roman Jakobson, who's often thought of as the most important linguist of the 20th century, the, impo the most important feature of language what he considers a central feature of language, actually, is the capacity to differentiate between what he calls marked and unmarked terms. This obviously plays a huge role in computer interface design, where you get a, where you get a dialogue box, and one variation of the dialogue box is what's called the default. If you don't do anything, it, that's what you get. Uh -huh. If you want the other thing, you have to choose it. The default thing is what happens automatically. Okay. It turns out that be, because you have, the, and, 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 and what Jakobson would call that is the unmarked term, that's the default versus the marked term that you have to choose. This turns out to be a momentous principle. It sounds very innocent and tame, but what happens is this, this enables you to move from a binary opposition where you have a marked and unmarked opposition to a four-term term, a four-term relationship where either of those, where, where the marked and unmarked uh, relationship can switch. So what if you start with this, you end up with this other thing. If you start with the right hand, the left hand becomes the variant. You start with the left hand, the right hand becomes the variant. So you can switch default. You can switch defaults. This innocent little sounding thing that enables you to go from a binary to a tetrapolar relationship opens up the recategorization of the elements in this thing. Recategorization turns out to be, according to Gerald Edelman, who's a, one of the primary scholars of consciousness, the key to how consciousness actually works. It's continually, it's a continuous process of recategorization. 
And so if you take this... Reframing. Reframing is, yeah, right. would be a... And for some reason in my head, I'm also getting these decision trees coming up as well. Yeah, well... Those, those per, like options, 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 permutations, possibilities. Well, what happens is, if you alter this, if you find out... I call this the linchpin symbol, the thing that can have, you know, two different positions. And if you start interplaying it and turning it into a four-term opposition, you end up recategorizing all the elements in the configuration according to oscillations in this central switch. In that process, you, you kind of take the thing from being a static configurational form into being a temporal form which generates narrative, generates historicity, generates a sense of the future. It kind of brings the thing into what we might call the third stage, which is the stage of what Piaget called formal operations. This is this is a, a sort of higher cognitive functions. So it goes from a maximum binary to then suddenly having a whole world of possibility in which many different things can exist. Can exist, but they're structured according to, to central variations. I mean, do, you, do you think there's some kind of link between that and the Chomsky idea of universal grammar? I think where, this where, is. Where I think there's, there's almost I, like a hole for every little what, permutation. What Chomsky's terminology, which he which he calls deep structure. You know that's that's what his uh, that's what his uh, theory of, of syntax is. There's a deep structure which the surface structure of language reflects. It's it's interesting you bring that up because I think that is very key to what I'm what I've been trying to do. We all have a deep structure of development. It's the process that we went through from childhood to adulthood. That if there's ever going to be a deep structure, that's it. But is that another way of saying being Eric or being Ranjan or just being you? Well, it's another way of saying it, it, we, we do that in individual ways. So, okay. it's, so it's both highly individual, but it's also totally universal. Right. The whole universe of human beings goes through this. So, okay, so, so there's a the kind of, structure. There's okay. a universal... This, this is what Chomsky says. I mean, all languages, whatever their, their differences, have this, have this universality to them. I think the universality that I was after has to do not with language, but with development itself. If development has a, has a progressive logic, why can't we use that logic when we want to set a transformational process into motion? Why can't we do that? Well, the reason we can't do it is we haven't figured out how. Because normally we start with higher cognitive forms, namely you know, uh, uh, highly articulate descriptions of things and decompose them into primary elements. That's exactly the reverse of how development works. So we're always going backwards. So we're, so we're always doing this big history lesson. Exactly. As opposed to as opposed just to, being. And well, going. as opposed to starting with bodily, in, 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 you know, involvement in the world, what Piaget called sensory, you know, thinking with the body is what he called the, you know, infantile life. It's thinking with the body. You're moving. You see something. You want it. You grab it. <laughs> Instead of intellectualizing it, you mean? We, we, well, intellectualizing comes much later. Right. And if you're going to call an intellectual, once it, once it comes, then you fall for it. Well, That's the whole point, isn't it? Because wasn't what well, you were just saying about the well, I, I, what I'm trying to say, wondering where you come from. What is I'm trying kind of to say, intellectual in, activity. Into, yeah, but intellectual activity versus intellectualizing are two different things. You know, intellectualizing implies a kind of draining of the passion of the you know of the uh, visceral yeah. reality of things and just substituting kind of disembodied thought. I'm saying if we start from the body, move through the acquisition of language to the formation of cognitive capability then we're not going to come to intellectualizing, we're going to come to intellectuality, we're going to come to thought, we're going to come to ideas, we're going to come to reason, we're going to come to kind of fully embodied, you know, a, a capacity for reflection. Because we started at the beginning. Which may be why we're here, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but that's, and, and because it's, it's not a repetitive process, it's not a regressive project, process. It's different every time. It's, well, yeah, no, it's, it's, it, it, it recapitulates a logic which is there from the beginning. That's what, the term recapitulation is not really used in psychology because they haven't had anything to apply it to. And what I'm saying is take the developmental model, use it as a format for expression, then that format for expression is going to automatically be transformative because it's based upon a transformational algorithm. Namely, human development. <laughs> I just lost the last bit. It was the last bit. So, so you've been saying that transformational 
Now I lost the last bit. Yeah, it's going to be transformative. What is inherently the, the experience of going through this because it's based on a transformational algorithm, namely human development. This is what, I mean, it's interesting that this is hard to convey because it's actually, to me, it's the most eminent common sense, but it's not the way we're taught to think. It sounds like you're saying a kinesthetic approach or something like that. It begins with a kinesthetic approach. Yeah, then leads to something transformative. Well, it's, it's got to be the entry point because the body is where, you, where, where yeah. child experience starts from. Yeah. It starts with the body. It doesn't start with discourse. Children can't engage in discourse. <laughs> yeah. So you can't start with discourse. It's not of starting with discourse and decomposing it. It's starting with the body and building up to the capacity for discourse. It's the other direction. Now, what kind of incarnations has your research had? Does Errol Morris know about it? He knows about it, but he completely messed it up in the... It's, it, it's kind of... He sort of included it in the film. It's, it's in sort it. of included in the film, but it's not well represented. And for which I'm not exactly happy. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, he, he makes a mess of it. He, what he does is two things. He uses the Colossus uh, aesthetic as a kind of design principle for the film. So you get a lot of montage. So I've already films. seen him doing it yes, in the first thing. Yes, and, and he tried to kind of say, well, this is what Eric's method is about. For raw. And he doesn't, he doesn't, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting your Eric because you said Ericsson already, right, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric and Eric Erickson, right. Right, yeah. 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 But anyway, it, it, so he, he uses it as a, as a kind of design principle for the film. Uh, okay, I mean that's all right, but it's not. It, it doesn't really help too much as grasping what I'm up to. Um, but then he, there's certain places, and you'll see this, I think, in the second episode and maybe the third. He interviews a guy named Rick Boothby, who I worked with for many years, who still remains. You know, we're still in close contact, and we we met each other in 1978. So it's a lot of years, 40 years, and Rick became a professor of philosophy. And so um, Errol interviews him as well about this method, but he, <laughs> and Rick does a very good job of kind of articulating certain parts of this, but, he, but it, it's, it's too brief, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, Rick had said much more. Errol wanted to save as much time in the film as he could for his bloody, you know, dramatizations, which I think are, to some extent, distractions. Um, well, he's known as a documentary guy, so I have to be honest. I enjoy the bits with you in. I enjoy the bits where he has newspaper story, you know, newspaper yeah. cuttings and 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 Seymour Hersh and stuff like that. When I see the bits with people tripping and stuff like that, I do. I mean, you did already say when I said to you, "Is it fact or fiction?" You said it's both. Um, and I have to say, when I see all that stuff, it doesn't feel very Errol Morris. I have to admit, I've probably only seen maybe one or two of his films ever. One of them was only six minutes long and was very good. But um, Well, he's talented. There's no doubt yeah, about that. So, but, but, but that but he also, thing, I don't, I yeah, don't really... I'm well, not so into that. I, well, I agree. I, I'm critical of it for a lot of different reasons, particularly in this film. But he, he in the, his first sort of breakthrough film called The Thin Blue Line used this method of dramatizing certain parts right. of the narrative. And what he wanted to do in this case was push that further. He always, he's wanted to create some hybrid form of documentary narrative combined with, you know, fictionalized dramatizations. It's not like no one's ever done that. Well, it's, no, but he's, he, I mean, I'll give him this, uh, this much credit. He, he, they did it because, you know, arguably he's, if not the first, he's one of the first to have done it. And oh, because no, he's been doing it for a long time. Right? He's yeah, been yeah, doing yeah. it for a long time, but but he pushed it further here. But yeah. there's another strand of this, which was <laughs> early on. He worked as a second unit producer for uh, director for Robert Redford, and Redford fired him. And I think part of his thing with his dramatization business is he's trying to prove to Robert Redford that he can really make dramatic film. Right. But I think in this case, it. It's pretty confusing a lot of the time what's actually going on. Um, did, did, did he ever have a conversation with you about the ashtray? 
he tried to, and I became very impatient with it. But anyway, going what? Did he try to sell you the ashtray idea? <laughs> uh, well, he he told me the story about him throwing the ashtray at, at Thomas, Thomas Kuhn. Kuhn. Yeah, right. And that he he so, so that Kuhn threw the ashtray at him. Surely he, he Kuhn threw the ashtray at him because Errol was trying to challenge his notion of the paradigm and return to some more kind of. Um, literal idea of truth and as in truth doesn't take directions well because surely that's what a supposed paradigm would be wouldn't it well a paradigm a shift in thinking that's my understanding yeah I thought differently about it when I was reading the first few pages of the book oh so you have read some of it I have I've got the book, the book. Oh, okay. I found it in my bibliomania oh, okay. uh, sort of binge and uh, I thought well I can't not get it and I did read the beginning of it, and it was entertaining. But at the same time, it was also him saying, you know, you've all heard of Kuhn, but actually this is my experience. You know, it, it, it sounded like he was quite into his physics, but he also was exposed to Kuhn, and he just always saw through him. I think he, he made him sound like he was the kind of self-indulgent, sort of pompous, stuck-up kind of Thomas Kuhn. That who was? Errol? Uh, no, Errol thought that of Kuhn. I, I, th- I think that's rather true of Arrow, actually. But <laughs> and I, I mean, I've become very critical of, this, of his whole defense of truth because of the way he messed up the truth in this very film. I was saying, I mean, uh, Morris has an attitude to the truth. What does he say? That the truth exists? Or does he say well, he tries to say that the truth exists and that he wants it. He's looking for it. He's not into rel- you know, relativizing the truth or... Saying the truth camp doesn't exist. Well, in such an un- in such an ultra unresolved case as yours. But it's not ultra unresolved. It's finally resolved. And does he cover that? He makes a mess of it. You took in twenty fourteen. Yes. Right. Though, and the, which is handled in the sixth episode. Actually, the, the problem with Errol's film goes before the the sixth episode. If you really follow the logic of this story as it's unfolded over these many years, the, the, the build-up of what you might call circumstantial evidence, but which is actually incredibly convincing, it, you know, is overwhelming. So by the time we came to 2014, there was very, I would say, I didn't have much doubt that we're talking about a murder here. I mean, that's what this was. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, the, the, the experience with Seymour Hirsch put the kind of na- last nail in the coffin. I mean, um, but he did it in a decisive way, which really s- surprised him. Um, a surprise is a weak word for what happened. Mm. I love it. I've got these shakes over here. And uh-huh. I've got Eric over here. Okay. So, 2014, Seymour Hirsch... So, can you go into that, or do I have to wait to watch it? No, no. Because well, you're talking, because we're breaking down the truth, and whether or not it came, and whether or not it was dealt with properly. Exactly. And so, what happened was, uh, in 2012, we filed a lawsuit for nearly $100 million. And... Yeah, you can use this yeah. Hi. Hello. Uh, if we're kind of in a, will we disturb you if we're speaking in here? Oh no, not at all. Okay. 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 So what? So okay. So we filed this big lawsuit in two thousand twelve. Um, which in 2013 is in federal district court in Washington. It was dismissed for largely technical reasons, statute of limitations, and so on and so forth. The judge was actually very sympathetic to our, you know, the, the complaint we filed, but the, the case was thrown out. At which point I thought, you know, I know this is a murder, there's no, it's done. I think what I have to do is kind of say goodbye to this whole experience right. and move on. So I decided, okay, how to do that, and and I was, and, and my idea was I was going to go to see the uh, chairperson of the of the Senate Intelligence Committee, um, Dianne Feinstein, at uh-huh. the, then, 
who had just had her own year, isn't she? Yes, who had just then in the previous year had her own horrible experience with the CIA invading her com- committee's computers when they were writing their report on torture, and she had gotten really extremely upset and so on. So I thought, well, this, you know, I, I could go to see her and give her all this stuff and you know, whatever. So I decided I would go to see Seymour Hersh, tell him that idea, and see if he and see if he had any suggestions of how to approach her and so on and so forth. So I arranged to meet him for a burger, which we've been talking about doing for years. So um, I tell him this plan. He says, that's bullshit. He says, for two reasons. First of all, she's not going to care. It's a waste of time. Second of all, there's nothing new in this story in 40 years. We already knew. We've known all the time what happened since 1975. Why are you going on about this? I said, you got to be kidding me. Have you been asleep for the last 40 years? This thing has, you know, gone through all kinds of transformations. He goes... Has it? Absolutely. That's what I'm telling you. I mean, well, by you're the, saying the circumstantial evidence has increased? Or? Well, it's, yeah, increased puts it mildly. I don't know mildly. if I missed that. I've recorded everything. Yeah, I don't you know, know if I missed it. it, it circumstantial evidence has increased puts it mildly. I mean, the thing had built up, built up by... This is what I talked about a moment ago, these increments that we've gone through, yeah. each one of which was kind of revolutionary. Okay. Um including, but not limited to, the exhumation of the body in 1994. Yeah, sorry, because you didn't really tell me much about that. Well, I can't tell you everything. I can't tell you everything. This is a long story. Sure, 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 sure. sure. But anyway, we're skipping a a hell of a lot of incremental... Right, and you're with Seymour Hersh. It's 2014. 2014, yeah. yeah. And I'm telling him there's been all this evolution of this story. And and he's like, oh, okay, And he hasn't been following it, and I said, look, this, uh, you know, this is a this is a murder, pure and simple. He and he's kind of screaming. But this is an LSD suicide. I said, look, he's that, saying that. Yeah, and I said that is a myth. That's a myth. And I he, thought even he was saying that it, it was that, that was true. That, you know that you were right. I mean, it, after 2014, yes, but not before. Right. This is what I'm about to tell you. So he 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 and I got into a huge shouting match, and finally he goes, look, wow. If what you're telling me is right, this is a very important story. I have to try to verify this. I said, please, yes, do it. Whatever you, whatever strings you can pull to verify this, do it. You know. So this was on uh, to a, verify what that it's a matter, huh? To verify that it's yeah, a matter. we're talking about an ho- intentional homicide yeah. here, not an accidental strangling, but an intentional homicide. It's very much like... It's not like, an accidental strangling, did you say? Well, that was Kosovo. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I'm just being facetious here. Yeah. Anyway, so he says, you know, I'm going to have to verify this. I said, yes, please do. So that was on a Thursday. It was uh, April 17th, I think, 2014. So after the weekend, on the Tuesday, which was the 22nd of April, he calls me up. He says, Eric, I found something, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> And so I said, what are you talking about? You're not going to tell me what it is. And he realized that's untenable. He said, okay, get in your car and come down here. <clears throat> so he takes me to this really deserted, dark bar that nobody goes to. And then we go into the back room, you know, where no one's going to see him. No one's going to hear anything. What? <laughs> I love it. Well, this was a, you know, this was a revolutionary moment in my life. Because it not only affirmed everything I knew, it kind of took it the last increment and just sealed it. I mean, and it was when this ended. I call it the end of the affair. It was when this ended. April 22nd, 2014. And what happened? He said he had gone to see this deep source of his, who he's been relying upon for really heavy information for the last two decades at least. Yeah. A guy who he completely trusts and relies upon. And he got what he called a one in a million bank shot. Errol in the film dramatizes this with some billiard balls going around, but he doesn't tell you what the <laughs> what the bank shot refers to. What the bank shot referred to is that Hirsch went to a guy who is his deep source. This deep source happened to be also very close to Dick Cheney. In 2002, namely right after 9-11, which happened in 2001. Which they say that Dick Cheney was 
deep in. Exactly. What was he into? He was into, quote unquote, the dark side, walking the dark side. What from what I understand, this may be completely the wrong thing, but from what I understand, Dick Cheney was one of the people who basically said, um, do not stop anything from happening that is happening, something like that. Anyway, carry on. Yeah, on, sorry, yeah. we're, we're going to use, we're going to do whatever we feel we need to do to go after terrorists, whatever. And he just, he, he just covered that with the term walking the dark side. Nobody knew exactly what that was referred to, but it turned, we, know, we know now. Cheney said that. Yeah. But, he, but we didn't know it meant renditions, which is kidnapping. It meant black sites, which is prisons, which are in third, third world countries where all kinds of torture can go on, murder can go on. Uh, it meant all kinds of extreme interrogation methods. It meant anything they wanted to do. And in that moment, you know, when they're planning this, he forms a small little working group to, 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 to go over you know, the question of, well, what can go wrong when you start walking the dark side? So we're not talking about an ethics committee, are we? We're talking about an anti-ethics committee. We're talking about... How, what can we get away with? How, not only how much can we get away with, but when things go wrong, how can we anticipate blowback? When you start walking the dark side, killing people, locking people up, you know... Secret interrogations. Are these unknown unknowns, as far as these guys are concerned. But the, yeah, they're unknown this is unknowns. Bringing it back to coon. Isn't absolutely. It's coming back Absol- to coon. Absolutely, it is. Yes, in a way, it is. But because they're they're, they're entering a new paradigm here, where anything goes, you yeah. know. So this is a different paradigm than we had been in, at least in that period. So in that context, he then. Ask this guy, we'll call him, well, I can tell you his name. I know his name now, but uh, his name is Bernard McMahon. But anyway, when Hirsch was telling me this, I hadn't yet figured out his name. Anyway, this is a guy who is a very deep source in kind of national security matters. CIA, uh, you know, Senate Intelligence Committee, you know, all kinds of stuff. And not to, not least his relationship to Dick Cheney. So, he t- in, in these... In this small working group in 2002, he suddenly tells Cheney, or tells uh, McMahon, uh, the source, to go into a very uh, limited access archive and find the real Frank Olson file. The real one. For some reason, he said to do this when? In 2002? 2002, when they're talking about walking the dark side. Go in to this archive, which is known euphemistically by the code name, the medical records. Doesn't have anything to do necessarily with medicine. It's just a name for the most secret stuff in the national security bailiwick. This is the real stuff. And so then what happened? It's what Mailer in his book, uh, uh, Harlot's Ghost, would call the High Holies. This is the real stuff, and it's 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 accessible only by presidential authorization. So Cheney tells this guy to go there, read the file. You can't take anything out. Read the file, take notes on it, come back and report on what's in it. Now, did Cheney know what's in it? Had he already seen the document? We don't know, but he at least knew that there was one, and he knew where it was. And the amazing thing is that Hirsch, when I kick his ass, tells his guy, he goes to see his guy, his guy turns out to be the same guy who Cheney sent into the vault to, to look at the document. That's what Hirsch calls the one in a million bank shot, which it is. I mean, th- think of how unlikely that is. So you said to Cheney, uh, you said to Hirsch, look, we need to be thinking about this. He says, oh, fuck off. And you say, look, man, um, this is relevant because... I just so said... You said, you said, it's a murder. He said, what are you talking about? He, and then, oh, that's it. You said, there's, he didn't tons, buy of, it. He didn't said, there's buy tons of it. circumstantial evidence. Yeah. It's all been growing. Have a look. And he says, all right, I'm going to ask my guy what he knows. He, he and asked, it turns out that the guy that he asked was the same guy who was told to look up your dad's record. Exactly. 
who then told her what he had found in the record. No, no yes. way. Of course he did, right? And Hurst told you. And Hurst told me. And he tells a very garbled version of it in the film, which you have a hard time, and you'll see when you come to episode six. He refers to this, but it's a strange example of kind of telling, it's what I call, what Derry Don would call writing under erasure. He kind of tells it at the same time mucking it up so you're not really sure what exactly he's telling you. But there's a lot there if you listen to it. If, I think in the world of whistleblowing, which is... Because again, you know, we're talking about yeah. secrets and silence and blah, blah, blah. In the world of whistleblowing, uh, which I can't pretend to know very well, um, it's not always the believable people who are the most credible. In fact, it's the people who sound garbled, as you said, who, who, who can be telling you the really true stuff. Yeah, well, Hirsch does this to kind of... Hirsch or Morris now? Well, well... Who's, who's the garbled one, Hirsch or Morris? Well... Hirsch is the, is the garbled one because he's the one who has the story to tell, but he tells it in a very unclear way. You mean Hirsch to you or Hirsch in the film? Or in the film. To right. me, it was very clear. Does he appear in the film for yes. the 2014 scene? He appears in the sixth episode to tell this story because, and I don't know what the deal was made with Errol, but I think it was that Either you get in the film and tell it your way, or Eric's going to tell it and you're not going to like it. Um, what, well, like Seymour's not going to like it? Right, because I'm going to tell the whole thing. Errol did an interview where I told in the interview basically what I'm telling you right now. Yeah, well, you haven't fully told me yet. Well, I'm getting there. <laughs> poor, yeah, poor Seymour. Because Seymour must have been thinking, oh, fuck. Yeah. Look. Uh, Eric's gonna kind of not blow my cover, but he's gonna. Yeah, I'm gonna blow it as much as I can, and I'm blowing it right now. That's for damn sure. I've decided to blow it wherever and whenever I can, because he's really pissed me off now. Well, Seymour has. Yes, absolutely. Because well, he was. Well, because he teased you in a way. You well, mean. yes, because he told. This gets into the subsequent thing. I mean, he. he the idea was he was going to publish this story. You know. The but whole thing. The whole thing. Tell the goddamn what happened, you know. But he kept finding a whole series of excuses, reasons why he couldn't do it now. He's going to do it next week, next month, whenever. And the, it would, days, weeks, months, and eventually years went by, and he didn't do it. So what was on the line for him? His rep or his well, sources? Well, I, I think I, th- th- that's an important question. I think he would say... The, the need to protect a source. I think it goes much further than that. What I think is that on the line for him is the end of his career. Because this, the, the, and this, people have a little hard time. He's quite saying something, because this is the guy who's like certainly threatened his own career many times, hasn't he? In terms well, of, not really. By, by blowing sensitive stuff. But what not you're saying, really. But what not you're saying really. is, every time he told a story, really, it was its time anyway, so nobody was but really it, but it, yes. Is that what you mean? But it's kind of. Well, what it, actually, more specifically... Hirsch has provided a certain, you know, release valve uh, mechanism for the national security establishment. There are a lot of people in, and for example, take Milan, the Milan massacre, which yeah. is his famous story. I mean, there's a lot of people in the army who are extremely upset by this. They don't, they don't like massacres, you know. And the fact that this was being covered up is not something that a lot of people in the army, the, you know, it's not part of the code of honor. So when Hearst divulges things like that... It was good for the Army. It's really. good for the Army. This story is different. It's not the Milan Massacre. Why not? Because this is policy that pertains to do you commit what I call national security homicides? Do you do that? Does the United States do it? But surely you've got the homicide, and then you've also got the reason why they did the homicide. Exactly. Well, you, the yes. Thing. So well, that's what. Yeah, and, and I'm still not sure what that is, but I don't think it's going to be very nice. Uh, exactly. I mean, you don't commit a national security homicide unless you have a hell of a reason. I mean, I, I, neither I nor anybody else would say they like to do it. You know, they do it when they're really up against the wall, just like you know, MBS here decides to strangle somebody and, and yeah. eventually, you know, dismember them. Because he felt he had to do it. It's the yeah. signal he had to give everyone too. But yeah, that if you guys fuck up, but this that's is what the happened. difference. He's giving a signal to everyone. Well, so was it Frank Olson. They all did the same, and the reason I oh, looked, but that was a signal just to the internal community. Well, the, surely that's not a signal to. It's certainly not a signal to you. I mean, they don't want to tell you that. Well, 
to start with, it was a signal to his colleagues. And That's what reason, I meant, yeah. And the reason I know that is because these guys were scared to death of this story 50 years later. I mean, it was, it was a signal that if you, if, if you think we're playing with you guys, when you, you know, you, you create these weapons, whatever they are, but we own them. And if you try to jump into the policy arena telling us what to do, Oh, I see. You're, you're, and and this is this is what happened to Oppenheimer. He stopped being a physicist and started to become a kind of a moral philosopher and tried to impede the progress of nuclear weapons because he thought he had a kind of prerogative. After all, he basically, you know, he didn't do it alone, but he shepherded the whole thing. They pushed him out, and they not only pushed him out, they essentially castrated him. I mean, they, they, they. Took away his security clearance. They really humiliated him. They wrecked his life. And his daughter, who I knew in college slightly, uh, ended up committing suicide. I mean, it was a terrible thing they did to him, which, for which they later apologized many years later. But so this is a message not only to the person who does it, I mean, who gets off, but also to, his, to the colleagues. Um, but then, it, you know, for others, I mean, for, the, for my family... And for other people in the whole community that we were in, it also was a kind of a signal because uh, it, it creates a kind of a taboo that this death, there's something about this death that doesn't add up. And people were scared of it. They, no one talked about it. We became, in a certain sense, taboo. We didn't know that, but it was. But you weren't scared of it. You don't sound as though you were scared of it. You were just there just going, what the fuck's going on? Well, on, I mean, yeah, but they're different levels. I, I wasn't scared. I, on the one hand, I was, uh, I was, re- no, that's not really fair to say. Oh, on one level, yes, I was very insistent what happened. But the reason I was so you know insistent on knowing what happened was this was a very scary thing. Yeah. One day your father is there, next day he disappears. And not only does he disappear, no explanation. Sure, no body, as you said. No body. And no that's the same as this guy. Exactly. No, no explanation. No, no, suddenly, I'm starting to see the parents a lot more. Now. Absolutely. It's suddenly, the world doesn't make sense. So for me, what was at stake was not just losing him. It was like, where the hell are we here? Mm, just He just falls out the window, maybe jumps, maybe whatever. What? And how come nobody is upset by this except me? But then you said, actually, it's a clear signal to his colleagues. Uh, yeah, it was. As you said, you you know you make the stuff. You don't decide what we do. With it. It's a form of discipline. It's like you know, if you guys think we're fucking with you, you know, you got to. But, but for me, everything has been framed along the lines of when I first met you a couple of days ago, when I got the impression that your father may have questioned some of this stuff. Absolutely. But I don't know anything about that apart from the fact that you pointed towards. Well, him. that's what happened. Yeah, he he went. Is that what Seymour told you? Well, that's you, no. Was, was that's that just ultra obvious to you from the very first. Time? Not obvious, but when I say that there's been a series of incremental, you know, um, developments, okay. you, know, I, you know, you found documents. Well, I, 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 a lot of things. A lot of things. I mean, this is a. I mean, it's really not fair to kind of box me in here in, in a short conversation to kind of explain sixty years of experience here. I mean, this Sorry. Is, the, well, it's true though. I mean, th- there's a hell of a lot of stuff here. But yes, over time, through documents, but especially through talking to his colleagues and so on, uh, and there's another film you should see called Codename Artist Show, which you can find on YouTube, which the Germans made about the, about the European side of this whole story with him. Uh, he was going with, to, with my father. Uh, really? Yeah, there's a very good uh, uh, documentary. Well, I mean, the European side of... Well, yeah, his experience in Germany. Your father was in Germany. Yeah, see this film called Codename Artichoke. Look it up on uh, the I, YouTube. I just assumed he was born in the U.S. He was born in the U.S., but 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 he he got involved in experimentation and of operations in the in the Cold War period that took place in a lot of other countries. Right. This was a very international story. Right. Very international, and that was one of the things I had to come to grips with. It wasn't just a question of what the hell happened in the fucking hotel room. It was what universe does this hotel room exist in? What, what is going on here? What's the issue? The issue is he's involved with a lot of operations and ha- knows a lot of things about things that are happening in Korea, happening in, in Latin America, happening in 
you know, China happening, you know, all over the place, Germany, so on. And England, porting down, I mean, all over the place. And, and over the years, you began to, other, pe other people spoke to you about it, and then you started to... Yeah, and I began to, and, and during this period, a lot of stuff was being published also. I mean, this was an explosion of, you know, kind of stuff coming to light. Hist historians were, doing, sure. did a lot of work during this time, which, you know, was constantly feeding my understanding of things. Um, but then Seymour kind of let you down. He, well, he Seymour you. didn't let me down when, when he told me the story. The, the, the reason I got involved with Errol and to make this film, which now is on Netflix, is that Errol approached me later that same summer. We're talking about 2014 now. Errol approaches me sometime midsummer about you know, this idea of a film. The attractive thing for me was to you know, get the final chapter told correctly. You mean episode six? Episode six. So and when I saw what he did with episode six, I was sick. I was really disgusted because he makes a mess of it. He turns it into kind of a melodrama and a kind of a a bit kind of like soapy. Exactly, and confusing and lurid, but not lucid. Right. This is a guy who believes in truth. He claims. And there is literal truth here, but no one wants to fucking deal with it. Does that mean that there was no real resolution in episode six? Or there well, was I've got resolution. email. That, 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 that's an interesting. It's you put that very well because I get emails. I've got emails from all over countries, all over, saying, "What the hell happened in episode six? What is her saying? Is it over? Is it not over? No one knows exactly what he said." So it is over, but you couldn't tell that from this episode. Well, since. you could get an inkling that maybe he's saying that, but if he's saying that, what exactly is he saying? <laughs> it's really a mess. And so what, what are you saying? Well, what episode? happened is, in this document, and I'm going to have to go to bed because i got to get up very early to take this airplane tomorrow. Um, what, he, what, he, what he found was that, A, number one, this, there was nothing informal or spontaneous or improvised about this, just like the Khashoggi business. This was an, a fully authorized execution that was decided in the CIA. He was taken to New York to be killed. To put it in more contemporary terms, this was a rendition. It wasn't, he wasn't kidnapped and taken to a third world country. He was ki essentially kidnapped and taken to New York where he was going to be killed. That's what happened. I'm starting to see the Cheney uh, 1974 link talking about 1950s renditions and then afterwards doing them in 2003. 2002, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. And it was only recently... what you meant. Then. It's only recently that I finally made... And it was through Khashoggi that, uh, that I realized that the operative term here, Hearst didn't use this term, but that the, the connecting concept is rendition. It's like, take, and this is what happened, you know, Khashoggi, they, you know, they take him somewhere, and, you know, and in that case, he takes himself to their, their consulate, and they kill him there and dispose of him. But in the, and, and something very similar happened. They take him to New York, telling my mother, oh my God, you know, Frank is going to become violent. Which she didn't believe. She saw no indications of it. There was no reason to say that. But they wanted to scare her. Why? Because if she weren't scared and protested, how are they going to get him to New York? So they freak her out, telling her, your husband's going to become violent. we got to take him to New York to get treatment. They take him up to a guy who's not even a psychiatrist. He's an allergist. Uh, who's a, you know, somebody my father knew years before. That's going to be the doctor. This is crazy. It's crazy shit. Really crazy shit. And that's not the cover-up stuff. That's really what happened. That's really what happened. And, you know, then they come up with this story that, Jesus, we try to take care of him, but, you know, he, he, and he had, he had someone, a CIA guy was in sleep, and, and you'll see this in the film, in bed in, next to him in the room. That's at the beginning of the first episode. Yeah. And the guy says, you know, here's a crash. Looks at the bed, Frank's bed is empty, window pushed out, 
puts two and two together, Frank must have gone through the window. Turns out that's a lie. When the police come up to, to find out what's happening, he's locked himself in the men's room, you know? Who has? The guy, the, the so-called escort. It's got him Lashbrook. Right, so it looks like it's, he was on his own, but actually there was the other guy there, right? Well, he was, he was, what happened was he was told, the guys who did the wet work come in and say, wait in the men's room, wait in the toilet, you know, we got, we got work to do, you know, we don't want you to see this. What? You know, they don't want him to see it. They don't want him seeing, it, you know, Frank getting thrown out the window. That's what happened. It's a nasty story. I mean, this is a really terrible story. But this is all in those documents that Hirsch's source saw. It's very clearly spelled out. Um, so I asked you one question when we first met, and that was to do with lessons learned. I said, you know, was it any good? You know, the show or whatever. And then we as a society, you know, you know, have we learned any lessons from this or will we? And, you know, the lessons learned side of it. That's a hard one because in 75, when, we, when it was, this was presented as an experiment going wrong, that's the way it was told in 75, experiment going wrong, you know, then there were plenty of lessons learned. Don't do human experimentation without, you know, proper precautions, medical supervision, whatever. To deal with your dad's treatment. Yeah. Turns out that was all bullshit, but it was easy to have lessons learned. When it comes down to what I'm now calling national security homicide, or what the, what the Israelis call public murder, a murder on behalf of the public, Okay. There was a, an Israeli journalist who told me that term, which was a real shock. A guy who's become kind of prominent since then, named Ronan Bergman, who now uh, writes for the Times, actually. Um, that, that's what this was. I mean, this, you know, it, it, was, it, was, a, it was an authorized, you know... Why, it, why, why was it done as well? It was a non-judicial yeah. execution. And why was it done? Well, in the film... You hear, you know, Arrow asks that question to Hirsch, why'd they do it? And Hirsch gives a very smug answer. He says, what if I told you I knew, but I can't tell you? <laughs> but all this documentation that's come to light and everything like that, is it actually Hirsch that knows more about what the real reason is? or does? Well, Hirsch knows it in a way that I don't know it. I mean, the, 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 the day that, that he told me what he told me, turned out to be, I thought it was going to be one of, you know, a continuing discussion with him. It turned out that was the only day when he ever told me anything substantive. He really quickly backed off. Well, he said it and then he tried to... Well, he didn't direction. try to take... No, he didn't try to take it, away, take it back. No, change direction. I mean, like, you know, talk about something else straight afterwards. Well, he kept saying, my question was, when are you going to write this? And he kept saying he was going to write it as soon as he is this. I could go through all of his excuses and so on, but that's a bit irrelevant. But anyway, I mean, what I was waiting for was him to you know, give a complete narrative account of what he had been told and what was... This is extensive chemical warfare, biological weapons program. I mean, that is, I guess, what we're talking about here, that Frank knew about. Well, he, it turns out he knew a lot about a lot of things. He knew, and I, you know, uh, I don't have it here. Um, yeah, I made a whole diagram of this. He was involved. He was involved with a hell of a lot of shit. First of all, he was involved with experiments on human subjects, biological experiments on human subjects. He was involved with supervision or or. Um, um, administration, and he wasn't actually doing it, but he was supervising programs of torture and extraction of information. This was in Germany, where they were collaborating with former Nazis about methods for getting information from people. This was a program called Codename R. It's called Artichoke. That's this German film. film. Yeah. yeah. Then he, he, had be, he also had become convinced that uh, 
biological weapons were being used in the Korean War. Right or wrong, this is a very, as you know, very controversial issue even now, but he had become convinced this was happening, and his colleague, who was the one who told me about this, had also become convinced that this was happening. He said the way, the reason my, the way my father came to know about it was because um, in some of the interrogations that he witnessed, some of those people came from uh, service in Korea and described it. Well, well, using it. Yeah, described using, yeah, uh, bacteriological weapons, which the United States was completely disavowing, denying, so on, you know. But at the same time, there were these captured pilots who were saying, yes, this happened. Then they came back and recanted their... These are the people who were brainwashed, those guys. Well, brainwashing is the issue. I mean, they, they, you know, the idea... The, the, what the United States tried to say was, these people, whatever confessions they gave were manipulated. The truth was... They didn't do this, but they were forced to say they did or led to say that they did. It seems now like the brainwashing was done on the American side, which had to do with, de with, with you know, getting these people to recant what they had said despite the truth of it. This is very fancy stuff. I mean, the United States was trying to get these people to take back these statements they had made. And it now appears that, and this is, you'll see some of this is in the film, it now appears that actually when the people, when these guys made these confessions, they were actually telling the truth. Right. But it became known as the false germ warfare confessions. So what lessons can we learn now? I think the lesson I've learned is that governments kill people. And I don't care if you're talking about Stalin's Russia, MBS's Saudi Arabia, Eisenhower's United States. In the, states kill people. In, in, in the place where I found the Ashtray book by Errol Morris and other books as well, like The Working Class Shareholder, which mm -hmm. I see the launch today. Um, in the last few months, maybe about four or five months, loads of Soviet books have come in. It's really interesting to think, these are all old, right? And I thought, maybe this is their time to shift them. And as I said, I've been quite interested in whistleblowing. I found a book about three or four months ago that was called Whistleblowing in the USSR. It came out around 1983, 1985. I opened, wow. it, I opened it up, started thumbing through it, and it basically said, in a society where ratting on each other is supposedly the norm, how on earth is it that the middle management somehow managed to get away with so much corruption. And it was really a case of they have procedures in place. And I just said, hold on a second, that's the same as here now. It's exactly the same as here now. I'm not saying that we're encouraged to rat, each other, rat on each other as much as they were over there. But like somehow, you know, everyone's like freedom, democracy, blah, 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 over here. And yet, when it comes to information, suddenly it just doesn't go out there. Right. Even though people working at work, they can see it coming. Right. They all know it's coming, but it never goes outside. Right. And, right. And, and I just thought, oh my God, it's the same thing. So when you say government's kill, for example... Um, well, one of my lessons learned is I frequently wish I'd been born in Moscow, where if someone is alleged to have you know, jumped out of a window... You don't spend 50 years trying to figure out that would the government consider throwing them out? It, it's not a hard question. Does the right. government throw people out of windows? Hello? <laughs> but here, in 1953, to believe that you're a kid nine years old sleeping in your bed while the government agents are in New York throwing your father out of the window, that's a far mm. leap to me. Because we had Dr. David Kelly here. Do you remember Dr. Yeah, Kelly, yeah, the yeah, weapons yeah. inspector? And my mum, she was a psychiatric doctor. Yeah, she yeah. Took, my mum told me, my mum told me those types of wounds that he had and everything like that, they're not self-inflicted. Well, and, and he, yes, and he was in the biological weapons field. Yeah. And he was one of the people who said that the, the Iraqis weren't, didn't have it. Exactly. That's a very bizarre case. Very bizarre.
but it's it's an example. I think it's I think that's a, a very close example. When it gets escalated and then suddenly the guy and it, and the story that came out about him completely incoherent as far as I could ever figure out. Yeah, they tried to say that they threatened him with his pension and stuff like that as a way of making it sound as though he was more likely to do it. To commit they suicide. Said, yeah, and they were, they were like, oh yeah, we, maybe we shouldn't have threatened his pension. You know, as if to say, we feel bad about that, as opposed to the other thing, which is we hired people to do it. Or, you know. Well, it's been a very interesting conversation and interaction. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we yeah. went straight for the meaning every time. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're good. You, uh... I hope you have a safe journey home. We are in touch now. So I'll, I'll, I'll work my way through those um, six episodes. And, uh, and then watch Codename Artichoke also, which is on YouTube. You can find it. Right. Yeah, that's, that'll be a good compliment to those six episodes. So what are, you gonna, what are you planning on doing with all this? Well, I'll just put it up on YouTube. On YouTube? Yeah. I might edit it slightly. I'll get the transcript as well. Um, oh, okay. uh, does YouTube have just yeah they, they have sound and then it's like a podcast yeah yeah I mean I found this thing which I use which I paid for which can punctuate it as well which would be nice because sometimes you can get punctuation what do you mean because YouTube doesn't punctuate it YouTube just has words 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 what Where, do you mean a transcript yeah with the transcript there's oh thing. I thought you were talking about a sound file oh yeah there'll be a sound file but then YouTube also automatically generates a transcript Oh, it does? Yeah, but it's unpunctuated. But I've got something which does punctuate. Um, so I might be able to do that. And then Fairly well, I mean... Yeah, pretty well. You don't edit it yourself? Uh, or you can't on YouTube, you can't edit it. Well, you, I mean, you can put it onto Word and you can edit it. Yeah, so you can clean it. Uh, you know, so I probably will. Well, that would be better than just an automatic robot putting in commas oh yeah it. all I'm saying is that the automatic thing I think is pretty good but I'll whatever yeah but yeah I'll um, I'll clean it and hand it over I mean I take it you don't have these types of conversations that frequently I haven't you know over the last period of time I had decided not to do any interviews but then lately I guess partly because I was going to make this talk here how did that go by the way I th I think it went very well. Was I mean, there many, were there many people there? Yeah, there were quite a few. That it was it was oddly handled because there was also a plenary session going on, and this took place in the in, a, in the cinema. cinema. Yeah, which so it was like, mm, uh, but the talk itself, I had really worked like hell on it, and I but I think, and I think people were very impressed, but they were also quite stunned. It's like. Wow, what is this? <laughs> because I went through both the, the stuff we've talked about. I went through both sides of it. In other words, the whole experience of my father's death and my attempts to come to terms with it, but also the psychological side. Um, and it was, on the one hand, it was very personal. On the other side, it was very intellectually demanding. So it was like, <laughs> it, was, it was something else. I mean, it was quite... How did you get a book to do it? Who, who did you know? Uh, it wasn't Seymour Hirsch, obviously. Uh, that's for damn sure. Because they booked him, you know. I, I know. That's, how, that's where I've seen him, because he's spoken there. It was, well, it was, the guy who got in touch with me was the, well, one of their people in charge of this whole program. It was a guy named Jake Reese, R-E-E-S. Okay. Uh, he's not the main guy. I forget that guy's name. He was director of this thing. Um... So Jake contacted me. I mean, obviously the worm, worm they had seen Wormwood, and 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 I, and they knew Hirsch, of course. So they thought it. I guess they thought it'd be interesting to hear my side of it all. And uh, it was. It's sponsored by this so-called Logan Foundation, um, which I didn't know much about before. But the guy who's the president of it was there, Richard Logan, and I got to know him. So that was kind of nice. Uh, and I was giving what they call the Logan Lecture. The first Logan Lecture. Really? Yeah, which they're going to have in the future, I guess. Yeah, I, I assume they filmed it. I assume they, they did. They did film it. Hopefully that'll go out. Because I, there was a lot of, I had a lot of slides. And so it's crucial that the, the, the slide, the whole... But they projected them very well on a big screen. And it was well done. It was well done. So I hope that all comes out clearly. And so they had a high technical level of whatever they did. Yeah, because I went down for one day. In fact, I was down there on that day, 
uh, but much later. So I tried to look around for you. I was, oh, there. You I was there for the surveillance capital talk at two thirty in the afternoon, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, and brought someone down who has written a book called Bullets and Bylines. He's Indian, but he was a foreign correspondent for the for the Observer in the Middle East in the eighties. And so when I was talking to him, he did actually say to me that actually it's the use of chemical weapons at Khalabja by Saddam Hussein on, I think, the Kurdish population uh-huh. that was the big game changer in the Middle East because I think he was using German um, materials to do that and no one said anything, really. I mean, obviously some people did over here, but, you know, it was kind of... It happened and Iraq was kind of a friend and it was kind of okay. Well, some of that stuff came from the States. In other right. words, Rumsfeld had, you know, arranged for some of those, those weapons to be given to him. Think of him shaking his hand. Yeah, there's a whole thing with Rumsfeld actually orchestrating some uh, chemical weapons to Saddam Hussein early on. But what would you like your so you you know these realizations that you've had some in terms of what I've asked you about in terms of what would you you know what have you learned from the experience of the film and everything about that, but then also what you were saying about your work to do with uh, not regressing, but, you know, reproducing yeah. that cycle Recapitulating, of yeah. Yeah. Where would you... How can that be applied? Well, that's, yeah, that's the thing I really actually care about. And if there's a tragedy in my life, ultimately, it's the fact that that stuff hasn't gone forward lately. I mean, you know, I've been, I got off the track, you know. Yeah, but that's what this conversation is also about. So where's it going? Well, I hope, I hope, you know, one of the things that happened in in recent years, Harvard asked me to give them a proposal for how my method, which they were obviously aware of because I did a lot of the early stages of it at Harvard. They wanted a proposal for how this method, and I'm quoting them, could be used to, augment the transformative impact of the Harvard College experience. So I prepared, I would hell, I could show it to you, I have it in the other room, hell of a proposal, you know, for instituting this as part of the college experience at Harvard. Uh, Whether they're going to do it, I don't know. We've been in kind of long-term discussions about it, but meanwhile they got sued for their admissions policy, which we never heard of. Yeah, that whole thing. And the guy who I was in touch with, the dean of the college, is now involved with trial and everything else. And meanwhile, they got a new president. The university's been going through some convulsions. So I don't know, you know, what's the next stage. I, what I need is a, is, is a place and a, a, a kind of a supportive context in which to, you know... Institutionally. So is that in a way to do with how Harvard will um, augment its user experience? Is that a... Well, they, they, this, the dean of the college had become convinced that um, students were kind of coming in one end and going out the other, and yes, they learned things and so on, but the, they, the, the college experience wasn't really transformative. You're they, at Harvard now, right? No, no, I'm not, but I submitted this proposal Where to are you now? Are you in at? Maryland. Right. <coughs> so um, what they were saying, look, we're amazing, but we are a bit conveyor belt. Yeah, this is the something experience. like that, something like that. And they wanted something that would really help students to, you know, reintegrate their lives and kind of, you know, go through something where they really confront themselves in some profound way. Um, you know how it was the 23rd of October, and it still is. You've heard of the 23 Enigma. No. So William Burroughs was obsessed with the number 23. Was he? Yeah, and one of my friends, his granddad, was William Burroughs' doctor. And William Burroughs invented the, 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 uh, the ad, not the adding machine, but the, yeah, office machinery, that was Burroughs, Burroughs' office machinery. What? Yeah, that's, that's where William Burroughs got, I mean, he was independently wealthy, and that's the reason why. No. Yes. Tell me. I think it's his grandfather. I think he's from father. St. Louis. Yes. Yeah. And the Burroughs, you heard of Burroughs office equipment? No. It's a huge, it was like a early IBM, although not computers, but adding machines and calculators and things like that. that that's his family. No. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because I wondered how he afforded to come here. So because what, what I heard was that he comes here 
in the mid fifties, trying to give up heroin and alcohol, and he has two appointments with doctors over here, and they say, "I'm afraid we're not going to be able to see you because you're a raving queer." Um, and so eventually, he goes to see my friend's grandfather. My friend's grandfather was a Quaker. He was a doctor, and uh, he used this thing called apomorphine. But the apomorphine, my friend, when I first met him five years ago, he, he was a photographer, by the way, uh, he told me back then I could tell that he thought apomorphine was some wonder, some non-addictive wonder drug. I now realise that he has changed his mind, and that he now thinks that apomorphine induces forms of constructive illness to help you defeat uh, an addiction but it's not about the apomorphine it's about the storytelling that you experience from whoever it is that's looking after you to help you get through and so in the case of Burroughs oh, my friend's grandfather looked after him more like a father figure at the time and that's really what helped him get through so there's something extra which is that storytelling aspect right. narr- narratological right. Right. aspect Right. And that's where the real stuff is in terms of the growth. Right. Well, yeah. and, and apparently he had experimented with ayahuasca as well, Burroughs. Um, you've heard of the Illuminatus trilogy. Robert Anton Wilson wrote this book called the, the Illuminatus trilogy. Uh, so Robert Anton Wilson edited the letters section of Playboy magazine in the 60s. And uh, he and a friend, their letters bag was unbelievable. And um, they basically found a device in order to get the conspiracy theories from their letters bag and put it into a book. Mm-hmm. And they actually said, we're not conspiracy theorists, we're just showing you the best that we've seen. And so they talked about various aspects of that. But Robert Anton Wilson had a series of different books. He was influenced by um, Kozybski and... Alfred Kozybski, he's a favourite of mine. Right. Science and Sanity. Yeah. Yeah. Very... I only heard of that through uh, Wilson. Um, well, he was very influential to Gregory Bateson, among others. Right, okay. Yeah, uh, Korzybski, I really, I learned a lot from him. So, yeah. so where does Bateson figure in your, you know, because you mentioned Bateson, so is, is he someone that you've looked at before, or just... Uh, yeah, I've looked at, I mean, he's not a primary influence on me, but he's interesting. I mean, he's, he's an important thinker, but he's not, he's not a primary influence for me. Mm. Korzybski was actually more. Sure. Yeah. Well, there's fu- something funny about the beginning of Science and Sanity. There's a quote from the um, uh, Jonathan Swift book, Gulliver's Travels, where they quote the bit about the mysterious flying island of Laputa. And I think that's quite funny because I read a book about... When I was studying in France, when I was studying banking, I read this book called Inventing Money, which was about the long-term capital management hedge fund from Connecticut, the Greenwich uh, LTCM. And uh, how the quants, you know, the astrophysicists and whoever yeah, else was, was yeah. running that thing, they actually thought they could fly, uh, which the mysterious flying island of Laputa is all about. <laughs> and apparently one of the Nobel Prize winning quants that was in LTCM was a guy called Robert Merton, and his father was the famous sociologist. Robert Merton also. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Um, and apparently the sociologist actually did a paper on the flying island of Laputa himself. Mm. Uh, But this hubris, it's this idea that we're so clever that we can fly. And in a way, whether that is experimenting on humans with biological stuff or whatever it is, you know, you begin to forget the curve that you were talking about at the very beginning and and instead you start going into other directions and, you know, actually it doesn't really help. By the way... Since we're talking about psychiatry in the, in in England uh, in London, did did I don't know if you kn- know this name William Sargent? He was my mum used to work at the William Sargent Ward in uh, Ealing, the mental oh, hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, he was. But I never knew his significance. Well, he's very significant in this person in this story, my father, because after my father's experience in this last summer of his life, namely in 1953. He wanted to talk with somebody who who would have a security clearance and so on and so forth, and he came to London and made the mistake of thinking that, he, that since since Sergeant was an MI6 psychiatrist, he could, you know, kind of 
relate to him. Relate, you know, tell him what he was struggling with. Oh no! And William Sargent. And that was a really bad idea, right? Well, it was what led to his death. William Sargent then relayed his impression that my father was not um, trustworthy. Well, that he was, you know, he had severe doubts. Let's put it that way. Did he try and say he was a communist or something? He didn't say. I don't. I don't. I don't know what he said exactly. But he 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 was that he was not kind of on the program, you know. And there was a there was an issue with him. How how severely what he actually said, I don't know. But that was that stop in London was a crucial moment in terms of this story. Do they cover that in Artichoke? No. How did, no. you get, how did you get that info? Well, I got it from a guy named, um, named Gordon Thomas, who unfortunately died. Uh, English? Yeah, he, yeah he's, he was actually Irish. Um, but he, yeah, he lived in, where did he live? He lived in Dublin, I guess. Um, but he, he, he wrote a lot about intelligent stuff. And I... You know, read some of his stuff and got on to the fact that he knew something about all this and I ended up calling him. We never actually met, but we talked a lot on the phone and he, he, and he knew William Sargent quite well. And Sargent... My, my mum worked at the William Sargent Ward in there Ealing, you go, there you Ealing go. Hospital. Yeah, he was a very prestigious guy, actually. And he wrote a lot about brainwashing and the psychology of what... <clears throat> Or what it is, you know, right? Behavior modification, behavior control, and so on. This was his his field, uh, but he was. There was supposed to have been a festival in 1967 that was called the Dialectics of Liberation at the Roundhouse in Camden, and um, what's his name? Ginsburg was there. It was organised by R. D. Lang, R. D. Lang, who uses yeah, the yeah. term double bind, uh, and. Apparently, because I found a biography of Bateson recently that's called Runaway, and um, Ginsburg apparently was asked in the 80s what was of significance that you remember from the 60s. Uh, and apparently, Ginsburg, of all of the memories he might have had from the 60s, said, Oh, it's Bateson at the Festival of Dialectics talking about the ozone layer and the greenhouse effect. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, really? Already, he was talking about yeah. that. Yeah, Bateson, who would have flirted with spookery, wouldn't he? Because he was in the OSS, I think. And, yeah. and then and he just said, no, not for me. I prefer to... But he was talking about the ozone layer already in the 60s? Well, the greenhouse effect. Really? Yeah, yeah and I found some books talking about the history of the climate movement. Uh, last week, I, I picked some of them up. So there's quite old books, you know, 70s, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, 70s was just when it was starting to become... A topic, you know, yeah. Yeah, ecological stuff. Um, and then afterwards, you look at these history of the Green Parties coming in and out. German Green Party is supposed to be quite interesting. There's a woman called Petra Kelly. I remember reading about her. So she's German, but I think she had an American stepdad. Spent quite a few years in, uh, in America and then comes back, runs as a Green in Germany. Ends up marrying someone that was older than her, who had been... Uh, East German, something in East Germany, or well, maybe West Germany, it must be West Germany, but it turns out after the, in the early 90s, he shot her. She was an MEP and stuff like that, head of the German Greens. He shot her, then killed himself, and they said one of the reasons why was because the files were about to be released that showed that he was a Stasi uh, oh, geez. Uh, informer. But he was an ex military guy who became Green. Um, so, mm-hmm. so that, that's one thing in the history of the Green Party of, uh, in Europe. But also, there's just uh, the degree of um, capture of that Green movement over here is unbelievable. So I think in 1989, they got 15% of the votes over here in a European election. And, you know, the capture, that may have been a big motivator because also the MI5, so MI6 is foreign, MI5 is domestic. Right. So the MI5... I don't know if it's the MI5 or the police, but they had special divisions for infiltration, the undercovers. So some of the undercovers took dead children's names from death certificates and then afterwards assumed false identities and then fathered children with innocent activists uh, who hadn't <clears throat> committed any crime. 
Um, Because, you know, you sort of think, my God, do you really have to go that far with the green movement? Is it really such a threat? But I remember I went to a think tank meeting, a uh, right-wing uh, think tank over here, and there was a guy there, high up at the think tank, who said, environmentalism is the new communism. You know, they've just swapped it for environmentalism. Said that when? What, what period are we talking about? Uh, this was two years ago in London. Two years ago? Institute of Economic Affairs. The guy's name is Richard Wellings. Uh, said it now. He said it now. He said environmentalism is the new communism. You know. I've never heard that. Yeah, that's how they, you know, they, you know, he, he, you know, he said that. He felt like he was, you know, at home, but, you know, obviously I didn't. I, I thought. Jesus, that, was that really shocks the heck out of me to hear that. That at this late date they're saying shit like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, when I listen to the Wall Street Journal, I can hear that they do acknowledge that climate change exists, even though they're so ultra, you know, Zionist and everything else that they are in terms of the, you know, really aggressively. But they still, because they've got the insurance uh, audience, you know, who work in insurance and stuff like that, they can't just pretend it's not there. So they do accept that. Um, but that book that was being previewed today, The Rise of the Working Class Shareholder, was talking about uh, when, they were talking about the separation of capital and labor, labor, and how labor has its own capital, and it has to acknowledge that. And therefore, you know, people in unions need to talk to their pension fund trustees and say, we want you to spend that properly instead of just giving it to BlackRock and Blackstone. You know. Anyway, we better wind up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you've got some journeys, but yeah. But that's a shock to hear.